Walt Disney once said, When people laugh at Mickey Mouse, it's because he's so human. And that's the secret of his popularity. It sounds so obvious after the fact, because there's not much that's funny about a regular mouse in the natural world. So if you compare the actual impact that a real mouse has on its natural environment, it's astonishing to think that Mickey has been inspiring for so many generations. But the key is in the quote. It's been given a label, and it's got a lot of syllables. It's called anthropomorphosis. And it's when we attribute human characteristics and behavior to anything non-human, like objects, animals, even gods. People have been doing it for thousands of years, but it was Disney who popularized it with a lovable character that everyone could recognize regardless of language. It all starts with the eyes. If you look at a clown anemone fish swimming on the reef, apart from the fact that it has brilliant colors, its life is seemingly unremarkable. Swim, eat, procreate, stay alive. But if you slap some human eyes on it, suddenly it's cute and relatable, and we give it a name and become emotionally invested in seeing him find his father. No matter what an object or animal is, if you give it human eyes, it immediately invokes empathy from us. In Beauty and the Beast, there was a teapot who could wink, talk, and apparently reproduce because it had a little teacup child. Even the candle holders could sing, and so it makes us like them because we can immediately recognize them as something more than an object. My four-year-old daughter was grabbing some socks out of her drawer and her finger got caught. Luckily, all my drawers have those soft closing hinges, so there was no blood, no bruise, but there was the shock of something not going normally. So she started to cry and held her hand I said to her, did that naughty draw bite you? And she straight away nodded yes. So I waved my finger and smacked the draw in retribution and it made her feel better. It allowed her to get angry at the inanimate object and give it a personality so that she could tell it not to do it again. As I was putting a little pink band-aid on her little finger, I said, next time you keep your little fingers away from the drawer's mouth when you close it, right? And she gave me a thumbs up with her other hand. So, I gave this piece of furniture teeth, a mouth, even a temperament. And recognizing all of these human characteristics helped my little girl relate to it accept the accident, and stop crying. One reason for this is because we are evolved to be pattern seekers. But we are also emotional. We are not robots. In fact, robots are probably the most obvious example of anthropomorphosis. For the sake of this discussion, I'm not going to mention the word droid, as it was trademarked by George Lucas. According to the Cambridge Dictionary, a robot is a machine controlled by a computer that is used to perform jobs automatically. But, according to the Oxford Dictionary, a robot is a machine resembling a human being, or able to automatically replicate certain human movements and functions. So, if we anthropomorphize any machine by giving it human characteristics, it becomes a robot? Unfortunately, it doesn't work this way unless you add some automation according to the definition. I had to cut down a tree in my old house to get rid of the branches and limbs 
I borrowed my friend's mulcher. This is one of those machines with some rollers and blades attached to a small horsepower engine. You feed the branches into the opening in one end, and it chews up all the wood and spits out mulch from the other end. And on the mouth opening of this machine, my friend had stuck two big googly eyes and drawn on a moustache. This immediately gave the machine a really discerning face, like it would only consume a certain type of wood. Now I don't work on robots, and I don't think anyone would call that mulcher a robot, but it was a machine that was given some human characteristics, and this mulcher's name was Chewbacca. This referred to the fact that it liked to chew wood and bark, and it made an annoying roar when it was working, resembling the noise made by the Star Wars character. My favourite screwdriver, his name is Jacques. He's small and red and very versatile, and he's named after Jacques Cousteau, the world famous scuba diver. An interesting thing happens to an object when it's given a name. The thing is immediately given the personality of its namesake. It's why you find a lot of French bulldogs named Napoleon. They're notoriously hard to control or train, and they are small, and they've got a complex about it. So they have to bark and carry on to assert their dominance over larger dogs. If I ask a customer how their bike is running, and they say, well, she's just not happy. Now, I know that not only has this owner prescribed his machine with a gender, so I have to watch my pronouns, but I also know that in my customer's view, it's my job to make his bike happy again. The whole point is, that after so many years of this, and the way I feel about my possessions, I just can't believe that this is merely a matter of language. Because it would be weird if his reply was to so cut and dry, like, my machine has lost some efficiency. But at the same time, it shouldn't be so weird to me that our descriptors have such human traits. One of my customers crashed his bike at the racetrack on a Sunday and brought his bike to me on the Monday. It just slid down the straight, so the damage was all superficial and cosmetic. But the way he described it was that chicks dig scars, I reckon it looks meaner with battle scars. So now this guy's bike has been given honours for fighting in a war. The machine has become a soldier. Side note, the reason race bikes that are being crashed make their owners look like they're really fast is because if you imagine a pristine race bike is either one that is constantly repaired or one that has never been crashed. This gives the impression that the owner is not willing to test the limits of the machine, which means they are probably slow. If you get a bike that keeps getting more scratches from sliding off a racetrack, it shows that the owner doesn't care about how it looks after the mechanical repair and just wants it to be as quick as possible so that they can keep going faster. So here's the story that made me think about this whole subject. Whenever someone phones the shop and books in their bike to have a scheduled service done, I always ask if there's anything specific they'd like me to check while I have it. And even though I repeat the question when they actually bring the bike in, some customers call while I'm working on their bike just as they remember to ask me to check something. And that's fine. While it's in for an annual checkup, it's always better to check issues now rather than having to bring it back again. One morning, a customer dropped off his Ducati 748 for a regular service. Bright yellow, decent condition. I asked the question, I always ask, and he confirmed that the bike was running fine, no issues. So he handed over the key and I told him I'd call him when it was ready to be collected. 
Everything was going smoothly during the service, and he called me around noon to ask for a progress update. I told him it was going fine, and assuming this was the usual, oh, while you wait, can you just check this? I waited for him to ask the question. And when there was silence, I had to step in. Is there something you'd like me to check on it? And he said, no, no. I just want you to let the Duchess know that I miss her. So not only has this customer decided that his bike is female, but it's royalty. And according to him, it should be treated as such. Now he wasn't joking, and I don't think he expected me to give it any special treatment. But there was a big part of him that felt that if he treated his bike with affection, then it would return in kind. Now there is actually some physical vindication for this. For example, if you constantly purchase the best products for your bike and give it more maintenance, it will perform better. If you spend more money on the grippier tires, the bike will handle better. But the detachment here is that it's not responding due to emotion. It's a machine. The more you feed it, the more it will produce. That's not even its purpose. That's its function. We are the ones that prescribe emotion to these machines. We are the ones who read more into what they actually are. And hey, I'm just as guilty as the rest of them. I can't bring myself to sell my first bike because it's too much of a part of me. It sits under a cover of dust just waiting to start munching miles again. When I look at it, I see my most beautiful possession. The machine that started it all for me. Some people come in and see it and say, wow, it's a Honda Blackbird. You don't see many of them anymore. Some people come in and say, what the hell's that? And some people come in and just can't stop staring at a customer's MV Augusta sitting next to it. When I was an apprentice, I had the pleasure of working on a very run-down Ducati Dharma. This is the old square case bevel drive that was popular before all Ducatis transferred to belt-driven camshafts. We call them rubber band engines now. And it was in bad shape, so I needed some help. When my unsympathetic head mechanic came over, his first comment was, What a shitbox. And I said, Hang on, this guy's paying us to restore it. Obviously he thinks it's worth something. Maybe to you it's a piece of junk, but to him it's his pride and joy. Isn't that why they say there's no disputing taste? It's all subjective. And he just said, nah, this is objectively a piece of crap. So I just laughed and left it. It didn't seem worth me trying to convince him. I tend to be more willing to defend machines these days. A Ducati is a perfect example of this. See, if you're not a rider, you're not aware of the factions within a motorcycle community. To some, if you're not riding a Harley Davidson, you're not riding a real motorcycle. And if you ride a Japanese motorcycle, you want a machine that's cheap, efficient and reliable. But if you ride a Ducati, you may be willing to sacrifice all of those things to enjoy the way your bike feels, sounds and looks. As a mechanic, I know that all brands have their own issues, but Ducatis seem to be more susceptible to electrical issues and they are very high maintenance. And even when everything's fine, some days they just decide not to work. And some people even love their machines because they're so temperamental. The point is that some people think they are horrible and others think they are magnificent. So who's right? Well, I'm not going to be able to settle this argument today because there is no disputing taste. One man's trash is another man's treasure. And the sooner we can all accept this, the sooner we can all ride together. If you still can't relate to what I'm talking about, then you probably don't own a pet. 
Domesticated animals are an extreme case of anthropomorphosis. We give them names and expect them to behave a certain way. We give our pets furniture, even clothes. We teach them to understand some of our language and reward them when they follow our behaviour. Sometimes I have a complete conversation with my little dog Cody. Yeah, it's more like a monologue, but it's comforting because he's always there just to listen, even if he doesn't understand what the hell I'm saying. The point is that whether we mean to or not, we treat our pets more like humans, regardless of whether it's the best thing for them. They are part of our family, and they certainly don't feel like possessions or property. We use them to give us affection. So is it really such a stretch to claim that sometimes we extend these affections to our most beloved machines? Machines have been doing work for us for thousands of years, and the Industrial Revolution showed us how the incorporation of machines into the human condition does lead to an increase in population and improvement in living standards. So, machines are everywhere, and they are created with very specific purposes. But when we give them human characteristics, they become part of us. And sometimes the result is that we treat them differently. If you owned a completely stock Honda VFR 800 for five years, and it was involved in a serious accident, your insurance company would supply you with the exact same model. And even though this is a machine designed and built to look exactly the same, sound exactly the same, even feel exactly the same, you might not relate to it exactly the same as you did to the first one. And this is a notion that flies against the idea of materialism. The idea of associating the value of an individual's well-being by the value of their possessions. Because these bikes aren't just machines or property. Even though the replacement bike is exactly the same, it's not the bike that you invested five years of your life in. It's not the bike that was with you through certain times in your life good or bad. The only problem is that we can't accurately account for sentimentality in our society. I checked the red book value of this bike. This is what the industry uses to assign a financial position to every model throughout the years. It uses a record of every vehicle sold and calculates the average. It removes all emotion from the equation and just displays the average amount that people have paid for this particular model. And at the time of this video, Redbook feels that this VFR is worth $4,000. And although it's rude to discuss price, I'll just say that this bike has had a lot more than that spent on it. So at the very least, I know that this owner holds more value in owning, riding, restoring the bike, and modifying it to suit him more than the value of its material worth. I don't know if this bike had a name, but I know that this bike enjoys some kind of relationship with its owner, and vice versa.
obvious because after many years of lying dormant, it wasn't sold or dumped, it sat waiting. And finally, its owner had the opportunity to breathe life back into it. For some people a motorbike is a cheap and convenient form of transport. To others, they can represent freedom, flying through the open road without being confined to a cabin and sitting locked behind a steering wheel. You're basically sitting on an engine. You can feel everything and it moves differently. And sometimes I get the honour of working on a motorbike that means more to its owner than a method of getting from A to B. Funnily enough, Walt Disney also said, whenever I go on a ride, I'm always thinking of what's wrong with the thing and how it can be improved. And as a motorbike mechanic, of course I can understand how he's using this particular machine as an analogy for life's problems. But I don't think he realized just how much impact he would have by sticking a mouse in overalls, giving him shoes, gloves and human eyes and a name, how much effect it would have to the way we interact with all the things in our lives that aren't like us. Whether it's consciously or not, when we make a machine more like us, by any small measure, then we are able to have a relationship with it. And maybe that's okay. <laughs>